So should we have a little look at the helmet underneath the crest? I'll try and slide it back. Um, and one thing that we have to say is this is heavy, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. When, are we not? We're not certain about the exact weight, but it's. I, I, I don't. I, I don't want to mention it, but just because I'm not quite sure precisely what it is, but heavy. Um, really heavy. If yeah. You think of the heavy helmets. Heavier than that. It's a. Uh, it's um, many many pounds. Should we say? Yeah, and, and I mean the crest has a weight, but the main weight is the helm. The thing that really characterizes helms for the joust of peace uh, in the late 14th century, which is when this dates from. It wasn't necessarily brand new when it was used at the funeral of Henry V. This could have been made as early as about 1380, but it equally could have been made in 1420. It could have been made before Henry V was born, or it could have been brand new when he was dead. Uh, we can't be sure because these, this, this typology uh, had a, a comparatively long lifetime. Um, it's kind of interesting to know that you can, you can find helms like this in late 14th and very early 15th century manuscript sources, for example, um, but they don't appear regularly on English funerary monuments until 1415, 1420. So one way or another, these things have this type of early frogmouth, early jousting helm before they take on the big swoopy shapes and whatever. They have a long lifetime, and it's hard to date it closer than circa 1380 to 1420. And, and you think this this is a this is a jousting helm rather than something that? Would There's be no question to... about it. Right. I don't think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, is that because of the weight or the design or everything? Everything about yeah. it. <laughs> everything about it. It's it's the weight. It's design where you find them in art, everything, of King, yeah, sure, you randomly sometimes get jousting helms appearing in manuscript battle scenes, but let's, let's not worry about that. Um, the, the fact that this, the, the, this thing uh, is not only of a very heavy construction, um, it has this characteristic reinforcing plate that covers all of the left lower side and most of the right lower side to here. Um, and this reinforcing plate uh, is nine millimeters thick. You then have a two millimeter thick plate as the inner skin of the helm, and then you have uh, what is it? I don't know. and then you have a two millimeter void between the plates, which is filled up with uh, no one mil one mil. However, it, it is precisely it adds up to thirteen millimeters thick. Um, the void is filled up with um, linen. It's got a linen interlining. Wow. Um, and that's, that seems kind of weird. Like a shock absorber? No, it's a, dead, it's a sound deadener, I ah, think. Ah, right. Um, so, you know, when someone hits you in the face with a steel coronel, it goes thunk. It doesn't go <laughs> PANG! You know, it's like in the 16th century when they say you should, you should cover the inside of your helm, helmet with beeswax so that when someone hits you, you don't ring like a bell. I never had um, that. No, I've been hit in the wow. face with steel coronels in, in jousting helms, and it can be really loud and yeah. discomforting. Um, so this, that kind of thunk action is not what you expect to hear from a helmet. They should, they, hel helmets are sometimes, as Augusto observed earlier, um, sometimes make very good bells, right, Augusto? It, um, they do. And, and, and this seems unusual. This is not unique. The, the, the pronk helm in Vienna, which is an earlier jousting helm, has an interlining um, in, in the reinforcing plate that I, I believe is horn, um, but I'm not absolutely certain. And the, the Liebes helm in Copenhagen, which is again a similar a related typology, doesn't have the interlining, but it has a void again between the inner and outer plates, suggesting that it, it once did have that. I think I think it's kind of funny in a way. A lot of the time with medieval arms and armor, we we spend our time debunking the idea that you know medieval swords were heavy and cumbersome and blah blah blah, and that knights, if they fell over, couldn't get up and this kind of thing. But this is an example of a genuinely exceptionally heavy helmet, isn't it? It is. And it, it, is. And it and I mean, I, I it completely does scream joust, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's what it's for. You know, it's 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 for a very narrowly defined combat situation you're never going to be in it for more than about half an hour at a time and it, it is for a joust of peace it is for a cordial combat held in a polite festive environment where um, people suffering brutal horrible bloody death would ruin the mood mm. right so you have to guarantee people's safety most armor for the battlefield can't guarantee your safety. It's as much protection as you can have in that situation, but there's a lot of other priorities. 
Whereas here, the king is going to joust personally in front of the whole court. This has got to be total protection. So you're taking that inverse proportional uh, thing and you're ramping up the protection as far as it will go, which means the mobility, the comfort has to come way down. The weight efficiency, just forget about it. Um, and this is going to be heavy. This is just, and the original, incidentally, is just iron. It's not steel. It's it's just ordinary garden variety medieval iron. And you would think, hey, that's kind of weird for a jousting helm that basically came out of the royal wardrobe. It probably wasn't Henry V's personal jousting helm because he never was really very interested in that. Um, but it may have been Richard II's personal jousting helm. It may have been one of some royal persons or royal family's jousting helm. And yet it's just ordinary, you know, iron. That seems kind of weird. But when the thing is, it's got a brow plate that's six millimeters thick, and it's got a face plate that is, you know, when you add everything up, is 13 millimeters thick. It doesn't matter what the metal is, really. <laughs> when you get to that sort of thickness. It just doesn't matter. And what matters is the thickness. And if you've got a good, easy access to some thick honking pieces of iron, just use that. What do you need to, to waste good steel when, when the iron for this job is gonna be fine? Um, that's a good so I think it's fascinating that it's made of iron rather than steel, but as you say, when you're dealing with something that's so thick, and it's funny because the front of this looks like the prow of a ship to mm -hmm, me. It's mm -hmm. you know, insanely, um, substantial and um, you know I can't reiterate enough how thick 13 millimeters with mm -hmm. a with a gap in the middle as well is I mean that's in that is just crazy thick isn't it for mm -hmm. a piece of armor um, but like you like um, Toby says it's very specific purpose and if you're gonna have something like a lance smashing into your face um, then yeah then 13 millimeters of steel might be what you want especially if you're the king um, so a couple of other things I noticed about this I'm gonna pick this up now and it is heavy it's not crazy heavy I can't put it on unfortunately because it doesn't have a liner inside at the moment I think you could stick it on anyway if you uh, wanted to but... shall I try it? Yeah, yeah, let's try you get lots of bad comments out. if yeah, you don't I don't want to break it <laughs> right now it's this is not supposed oh. to rest on your shoulders no I see okay you so that's... line it up with your eyes and that's where it's supposed to be basically. Ah, it's quite comfortable in here actually. Right. It's, it's obviously it's not touching my head anywhere and I've actually got quite good vision. Yeah you do, that's the thing yeah. about these things. For, you can see what you need to see. Yeah. You can't see your horse, you can't see your hands, you have no peripheral vision really, but you can see really well straight ahead which is, is what you need to see when you're playing the game. And I'll tell you what, I think I've got better vision in that than I do in my, um, in my pig face. Bassner, actually. Um, but something on here is, let me just hold up at the front, you see between my hands, there we go, a little ring. What's that for? <laughs> yeah, um, and, and I guess it's important also when you point out the ring in the front, if we can see this, um, to point out the great big hasp in the back. Um, so this, this is a helm that in, in you know, typical style for 14th century, late 14th, early 15th century jousting helms, is fastened down to the back, to the to the armor in the back, um, the the sort of mid plate in the back of a of a segmented back plate or whatever. They've got they've got a they've got a hard point for attaching the helm in the back. Uh, now the the important thing to note though is that they don't attach it down in the front. Um, and this ring that's actually been put on here by the armorer uh, is actually stronger and hev more heavily built than the ring that's actually on the helm now. Um, I'm not sure why I did that actually. Maybe again, I'm going to make another one. Um, um, the one that's on there is a very, very delicate uh, ring of twisted copper alloy. It's not even iron. Mm. And it would never hold anything. Okay. I mean, it's it's we it's just decorative. Right. Interesting to note that this this particular type of rings that are made out of twisted a twisted band uh, are the uh, the standard pendant on Lancastrian livery collars, right? Okay. So I'm wondering whether this decorated band is kind of somehow fulfilling the role of a livery collar or. We're just looking kind of like one, and we like to have pendants on the, you know, the front, so we're going to put a pendant on this. But as far as we can tell, it's um, it's purely decorative. I'm going to go. Yeah, have a look at that freestyle here. So this, so I mean, again, this this one is much more heavily built than the real one. 
Um, the real one's much lighter, it's copper alloy, it's twisted. It's a piece of jewelry, basically. Um, the functional hasp is in the back. This was never attached in the front. And that might actually have something to do with the yeah, weight as well. Um, making it heavy uh, helps keep it lift from lifting off the head when you, when you get hit. Um, and this is a period when they describe in jousts, when very hard hits take place, that, that jousters are sometimes unhelmed. The helm gets knocked off their head. And that is actually one of the ways that you can register a good hit. And you actually can score a joust according to whether you knock your opponent's helmet off or not. So there's something about that going on. And, and even great bassinets for war at this time, they're usually fastened down at the back but not at the front. Uh, I know it seems weird, but that's the fact. Uh, they only start fastening down helmets, both jousting helms and great bassinets. They only start fastening them down at the front, you know, later towards the mid 15th century. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, as you were talking, I was wondering about the um, possibility that maybe that was for um, the reason that you mentioned that if the helm gets knocked off, it sort mm -hmm. of hangs at the back mm -hmm. and you don't doesn't fall off completely. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd want this thing hanging off no. my back, really. It'd be like being hit by a sledgehammer in the back, couldn't it, as well? Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> you know, but it's easy in hindsight to say, well, obviously, this is how jousting equipment should be set up. You strap it down here, you strap it down there, you do this, you do that. But we have the benefit of all that cumulative knowledge. Mm. They hadn't done that yet. They weren't in the 15th century yet. Mm. Uh, the, the, the whole cons... Yeah, this is like, right around 1400-ish we are still at fairly early days for the development of specialized jousting armor. Uh, you know, the, the, in the sense that the jousting armor is a complete system that is different from the armor for war. They, this, this concept is still just developing that they can custom build really different things and really depart from the methodology of war equipment. Mm. Um, so they're still feeling their way through what is the best way to build an armor for this kind of festive um, joust of peace. That's been fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so if people want to see this helm and yep. read more about it, they can Big graphic panels, we've got, we've got images showing these things being built, you know, um, you know in progress pictures of both the helm and the, and the crest. And, uh, in, and in Westminster, um, uh, this is being built in the in the in the armorers' workshops. I mean, right, right. Um, and that opens on uh, the sixth of October, and then it's gonna this is it's gonna be up for at least four months at the Wallace Collection if you want to come and see it. Um, and then ult ultimately, a little farther down the road next year, a monograph is being um, published by um, uh, Thomas Del Mar, who published my English armor book. He's mm -hmm. publishing this. Uh, this special research volume on the funerary achievements, the shield, helm, sword, saddle, and that's coming out next year, I think. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And yes. thank you, Augusto, as well, who's off screen. <laughs> and see you guys soon. <laughs> thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.